This is your crime. This is what you got to do to fix it. Literally truth in plain sight. It's crazy. Thank you so much, uh, uh, King Vaughn. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, thank you, thank you, family. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Teamwork. Teamwork. Look, they ain't say nothing about no money. They said credits. This is facts. What if they created the whole system of credit just so they can get to this moment? You had no idea of credit. So how they gonna tell you credit? They ain't gonna save money. They don't operate out of money. They operate out of digital credit. Like a debt. What if they created all of these things for 2030? Think about it. Honey, I got a job! It's a trap! Abort! I'm still in his showings! Repeat! Showing hard to have a job during this time frame. Not even necessarily to get a job, it's just hard to have a job during this time frame. Pay attention to all these little things. On top of the fact that the insects dressed up like men in black. We never left his showings! Mission accomplished, boys. Pull me out. Roger that. Abort! We never left his... Ah! <laughs> I tell you, the Galactic Federation taking over Earth, best thing that's ever happened to this family. Damn. Hold on. Look. Y'all fucking did Now, I know y'all done seen the clips of the flying cars they about to come out with. Truth in plain sight. All this stuff is symbolic for the introduction of the Galactic Federation. I don't fuck with them like that. I'm going to just be real with you. And they already know it. And the Galactic Federation is not the Orion Council. And the Galactic Federation is not the Anunnaki. Now, are the Anunnaki initiated into the Orion Council? Yes, but the Orion Council is three separate things. And when one gets introduced, be ready for the others to start popping out. Sometimes you gotta pop out and show this. <laughs> oh, God, I do it. You don't coming. think they possess Kendra? There's so many oh, God, I codes it. just in Not Like Us. I should do a video just breaking down what he's really saying in Not Like Us. I tell you, the Galactic Federation taking over Earth, best thing that's ever happened to this family. I just got my sixth promotion this week, and I still don't know what I do. Who cares how high they promote you? Everyone just gets paid in pills. One thing still perplexes me. Why would Rick Sanchez turn himself in? Well, I'm just a dumbass bug, but it's possible Rick knew we'd be interrogated at this facility where we not only keep our most wanted, but our most sensitive data. Anyone here with level 9 access to, uh, I don't know, collapse the government? I'm just gonna go take a dump. Is it cool if I use the level 9 bathrooms? What's the level 9 master access code again? Oh, that's easy. Eight, three... He just teleported into a galactic federal prison. Now I go take a shit. And that is how you get level 9 access without a password. Freeze! Employee of the month, ladies and gentlemen. So what are you doing with level 9 access anyways? Destroying the uh, galactic government. Whoa. Awesome! Oh. Are you going to send all their nukes to target each other? Or, or reprogram their military portals to disintegrate their entire space fleet? Good pitches, kids. I'm almost proud. Watch closely as Grandpa topples an empire by changing a 1 to a 0. Mr. President, the Blenflark's value just dropped to nothing. What do you mean? I mean, our single centralized galactic currency just went from being worth one of itself to zero of its... Which means it's going to be a digital cryptocurrency. This is... This is... The Feds is trying to come out with their own cryptocurrency. And I want you to understand the federal government is a micro version of the Galactic Federation. The federal government does what the Galactic Federation tells them to do. And... Do you see this? Do you see this? So like in this case, in this case, you can kind of think of Elon and Trump kind of like Rick and Morty. And Elon and Trump right now is kind of Rick and Morty in the Galactic Federation. <laughs> fucking them up. What you mean you about to give Trump $45 million a week? And then I did the math. Elon, 
out of his own pocket can give Trump $45 million for the next 16 years. $45 million for the next 16 years. And that's just what he's worth now. Imagine if you use the next 16 years to make the money back. To just say, he, say listen, I need you to understand that Elon has the type of money that can change the infrastructure of a country. Imagine if he offered $45 million a month to help with the building up of America. Why not? It, it don't even look like Elon will fuck about the money like that. He ain't Bezos. Them is two different operatives. Hold on, people. There's a solution here you're not seeing. Give me your jacket. Give me those pants. He who controls the past controls the galaxy. <laughs> My bosses are bugs, Rick. You killed the old ones, the new ones are half my age. They know if you're left alone, you're a non-threat. Congratulations, Earth, on being destroyed by the NX-5, brought to you by Wrangler. Come on, kids, we have to go do a f***ing piece of Star Wars. Attention, Zeta-99-2, we know you have a stolen ship. Stand down. Oh, am I not a non-threat now? <laughs> You're not clear to land. We will open fire. Hold your ground, man. You'll be heroes. The NX-5 can't destroy Wrangler genes. Like it literally can't destroy them or it's programmed not to? Gene, what do you think? It's marketing. Like, uh, the NX-5 destroy... Did y'all catch that? They slick. So whatever weapon they got, they're saying they can't kill off every single person. Certain people on the planet have a genetic configuration that can't be... Touched. Their advanced technology can't fuck with them. Truth in plain sight. Destroys the whole planet except for the Wrangler gene. Because they're so tough. Tougher than a laser? Stupid. You're talking about it. You're right. They, they got me. Hey, over here! Look at me! Did you just see a pantsless little boy run by? I'm not falling for that again. And I saw a corp. Now, if you want me to... Kind of give you my guess on what they're talking about. Wrangler genes are talking about those who have activated their Taurus field. <clears throat> so a Wrangler is someone who wrangles up cows. Another word for a Wrangler would be a cowboy. And if you've shown allegiance to the cow, to the feminine polarity, and in addition to understanding your Taurus field, one can survive a galactic war that may place itself on this planet while we are still on this planet. Corporate sponsor detected. Cannot penetrate Wranglers. Built too tough. Built too tough. Why can't I meet your parents? Are you embarrassed of me? No, of them. Aww. <laughs> Very interesting episode. See, I try to tell you, I, I try to watch these things with you I try to watch these things with you That way you can get a genuine reaction. I don't know what the hell is about to come up neither. Alright. Here's the next clip I thought was really interesting. Aimed members of the Galactic Council. This message is not a greeting, but a dire and urgent warning concerning humanity. Humans are, in many respects, remarkably average in terms of intelligence. They can range from incredibly ingenious to surprisingly simple. I have encountered humans capable of directing entire asteroid fields out of star systems and mining them clean of resources without the aid of AI. Yet these same individuals struggle with mundane tasks like restocking a vending machine. Another human might falter at simple arithmetic but can repair a fusion reactor with nothing more than a pipe wrench. In terms of combat ability, let us not consider humanity's elite super soldiers, the legionnaires, but rather the average human grunt. 
I know riflemen who are poor marksmen with a Gatling gun, but become unparalleled warriors when wielding a knife. Conversely, a human sniper can hit a coin-sized target from two miles away in a hurricane, but would be outmatched in a boxing ring. Humanity encompasses the fastest and slowest, the smartest and dumbest, the fiercest fighters and the most ardent pacifists among us. This diversity is why humans have found a unique niche within galactic society, simultaneously admired and resented. Humans can adapt to almost any environment suitable to their biology, becoming indistinguishable from their kin through sheer tenacity. Yet my purpose is not to sing their praises, but to issue a serious warning. Humans are far more dangerous than they realize, especially when it comes to their children. All species are protective of their young, but humans take this to a new level. Allow me to recount an incident involving a human crew member named Casey, who served as a janitor aboard my ship, the Radiant Dawn. Casey quickly bonded with the younglings aboard, becoming their unofficial caretaker. During a routine cargo trip to a human colony, our ship was attacked by the notorious Ronnie Pirates, the King's Masons. They disabled our ship and began looting, cutting their way into the cargo bay where Casey and the children were located. When a pirate threatened the children, Casey stood her ground despite being overpowered. She instructed the children to hide, protecting them with an unwavering resolve. The pirate's offhand comment about making juvenile-flavored soup triggered an extraordinary response. With a ferocity born of pure instinct, Casey defended the children, overpowering the pirate through sheer determination and bravery. The other pirates, witnessing Casey's unwavering defense and sensing her resolve, hesitated. In the face of her protective instinct, they chose to retreat. They managed to restore basic functionality to our ship and make an emergency jump to the human colony. When the human fleet arrived to assist us, they simply shrugged when informed of Casey's actions, considering them typical of human behavior. Humans possess an unparalleled instinct to protect juveniles, regardless of species. Yep. This instinct drives them to acts of bravery and selflessness, often disregarding their own safety. This protective nature is even more pronounced with their own children and close ones. I urge you to heed this warning. Do not, under any circumstances, harm a child in the presence of a human. You risk provoking a force driven by the most potent instinct in the universe. Here. Hear this? I hope y'all. This is important. This is our super weapon. Our children. This is why attacking the nuclear home is so important. To make you not care about the children anymore. This is why I'm playing this clip. Parenthood. This aspect of humanity makes them formidable allies or fearsome enemies. Choose your actions wisely. Sincerely, Prax Thrawn, Captain of the Radiant Dawn Human Space Epsilon Station. As Captain Prax Thrawn sent his urgent message to the Galactic Council, Casey's actions aboard the Radiant Dawn became a topic of fascination among the crew. The younglings, a mix of various species, began to see her not just as a caretaker, but as a protector. Casey's bond with the children deepened and she became an integral part of their lives, teaching them games, stories, and skills from Earth. Casey's influence extended beyond her role as a janitor. She started to assist in various ship operations, showcasing her versatility and adaptability. Her ability to connect with the crew members and younglings alike made her a beloved figure aboard the Radiant Dawn. Meanwhile, Captain Prax Thrawn continued to monitor the Galactic Council's response to his warning. He knew that the message he had sent was critical, and he awaited their acknowledgement with a mix of anticipation and anxiety. The Council's understanding of humanity's unique protective instincts could shape the future interactions between humans and other species. In the grand halls of the Galactic Council, the members received Captain Prax Thrawn's warning with mixed reactions. All right, I've actually seen this on like social media. And this is what I would tell you. What they did on Epstein Island wasn't just 
Okay. Epstein Island Island is no different than like a club. Tuesday nights, maybe R and B night. Thursday night is college night. Friday night for the swingers. Saturday night for everyone like to dress up like furries. Sunday, the religious folks that like to come together and get freaky. This was how Epstein's Island was. I need you to stop thinking so. Not through L, you great. I'm just saying people. We like to just think limited. And we have to expand our horizon. So if there is an island where you can do whatever the fuck you want, it just depends on what you into. This is why I believe Trump and others are nervous. And this is why I also believe they didn't release the list like that. Because not everyone on that list was into the, 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 the younger aspects of things. Some of them maybe like dressing up like furries. Some of them like to bring their wife in and we all can start a swinging like monkeys on this island. So that's, it's a fit, there's the word, it's a fantasy island. And it's there to fulfill your fantasies and it's ritualistic in a way to limit the realm of fantasia. <laughs> Get back to this story. Actions. I, Chancellor Zylar, a wise and experienced leader, called for a session to discuss the implications of the message. Representatives from various species gathered, each bringing their perspectives on humanity and their potential threat or allyship. Chancellor Zylar began the session. Captain Thrawn has brought to our attention a critical aspect of humanity that we must understand. Their protective instincts towards children, regardless of species, could be both a strength and a danger. We must deliberate on how to approach this knowledge. Ambassador Lyra of the Tarian Alliance spoke first. We have long known humans to be versatile and adaptive. This new information about their protective nature only confirms their potential as valuable allies. We should seek to strengthen our bonds with them. Contrarily, General Crox of the Zevran fleet expressed caution. While their protective instincts are commendable, we cannot ignore the potential threat they pose. A species driven by such powerful emotions can be unpredictable. We must approach this with caution and ensure our defenses are prepared. The deliberations continued for hours, with each representative weighing in. The Council ultimately decided to send a delegation to Human Space Epsilon Station to learn more about humanity's protective instincts firsthand and establish a dialogue to ensure mutual understanding and cooperation. A delegation from the Galactic Council arrived at Human Space Epsilon Station, led by Ambassador Lyra and General Crox. They were greeted by Captain Prax Thrawn and Casey, who had become a symbol of humanity's unique traits. The delegation spent days observing the humans, interacting with them, and learning about their culture and values. Casey shared her experiences and insights with the delegation, explaining how her instincts to protect the younglings had driven her actions during the pirate attack. The delegates witnessed the deep bonds between Casey and the children, understanding that her actions were a manifestation of a universal human trait. As the delegation prepared to return to the council, Ambassador Lyra spoke to Captain Thrawn. Your message has opened our eyes to a profound aspect of humanity. We see now that your people's protective instincts are not just a potential threat, but a remarkable strength. We will convey this understanding to the Council and work towards a harmonious relationship. General Crox added, While we must remain vigilant, we also recognize the value of having such allies. Humanity's strength lies not just in their abilities, but in their hearts. We will recommend measures to ensure that our future interactions are based on mutual respect and cooperation. Upon their return, the delegation's report led to a new era of cooperation between... Just in case we didn't catch that, humanity's superpower, the protection over their children, 
and the ability to truly use one's heart. These are like threats. They're fearful that you discover the power of your heart, meaning you've learned how to fill the emptiness with love. Humanity and the Galactic Council. Policies were enacted to foster mutual understanding, and joint ventures were established to explore and protect the galaxy together. The Radiant Dawn became a symbol of this alliance, with Captain Prax, Thrawn, and Casey representing the unity between humans and other species. Casey's bond with the younglings continued to inspire others, and her story was shared across the galaxy. She was invited to speak at various interstellar events, where she emphasized the importance of protecting the vulnerable and working together for a better future. Humanity's unique traits, once seen as average, were now recognized as exceptional. Their adaptability, diversity, and protective instincts became pillars of strength in the Galactic Federation. The Alliance thrived and the galaxy witnessed an unprecedented era of peace and prosperity, all sparked by the actions of one remarkable human aboard the Radiant Dawn. Years later, Captain Prax Thrawn and Casey were celebrated as pioneers of interstellar unity. The Galactic Council established the Prax Casey Institute, dedicated to fostering understanding and cooperation among species. Younglings from all over the galaxy attended the Institute, learning about the values of empathy, protection, and unity. Casey's story became a legend, inspiring future generations to embrace their protective instincts and work together for the common good. The Radiant Dawn continued its missions, now a beacon of hope and cooperation in the vast expanse of space. Humanity's legacy was no longer one of average traits, but of extraordinary courage, compassion, and unity. The galaxy had learned that the greatest strength lay not in advanced technology or superior intellect, but in the simple, powerful instinct to protect and care for one another. And so, under the stars of a united galaxy, the legacy of the Guardian instinct lived on, a testament to the remarkable potential within each and every one of us. The story of Captain Prax Thrawn, Casey, and the Radiant Dawn serves as a reminder that sometimes... The most extraordinary qualities can be found in the most unexpected places. As the alliance between humanity and the Galactic Council flourished, a new threat emerged on the fringes of known space. A race known as the Varn, highly advanced and ruthless, began to encroach upon territories held by various species within the Galactic Federation. Their motives were unclear, but their actions were undeniably hostile, prompting the Council to call for a united defense. Captain Prax Thrawn and Casey were summoned to lead a joint task force to investigate and, if necessary, counter the Varn threat. The Radiant Dawn, now upgraded with the latest in defensive and offensive technology, set out with a diverse crew of humans and aliens, each bringing their unique strengths to the mission. The Radiant Dawn's journey led them to the remote sector of Zeta-5, where they encountered the first signs of Varn activity. Abandoned colonies, wrecked <laughs> ships, and desolate landscapes painted a grim picture. During a reconnaissance mission, the crew detected a Varn scout ship. Prax ordered an intercept and a tense standoff ensued. Casey, now a senior op <clears throat> The word Varn means to shield or to defend. So, if you've watched Star Trek, um, the one with the uh, female, I forgot the name of it, but um, Discovery. Uh, they have an issue with the Klingons in the first season of Star Trek Discovery. And the Klingons feel as if the Galactic Federation is trying to change their traditions, to change their belief systems, to change their indigenous ways. So it's almost like the Klingons had to shield or defend themselves from the Galactic Federation. So it's interesting that they're called Varn or to varnish. A 
like that or vanish. It's interesting to make something go away. Interesting. Very interesting, these connections. Her officer coordinated the crew's efforts, her protective instincts driving her to ensure everyone's safety. The Varn ship, realizing it was outmatched, attempted to flee. The Radiant Dawn pursued, capturing the vessel and its crew. Interrogations revealed the Varn's plans to expand their territory through conquest, sparking a sense of urgency among the crew. With the Varn threat confirmed, Captain Prax Thran called for a meeting with representatives from allied species. The Radiant Dawn hosted a summit where leaders discussed strategies and shared intelligence. Among the attendees were Ambassador Lyra and General Crocs, who brought valuable insights into the Varn's tactics and technology. During the summit, tensions arose as different species debated the best course of action. Casey played a crucial role in mediating conflicts, her empathy and understanding helping to forge a unified strategy. It was decided that a preemptive strike on the Varn's forward base would be necessary to halt their advance and send a clear message of resistance. The Joint Task Force launched a coordinated assault on the Varn's forward base. The Radiant Dawn led the charge, its crew demonstrating exceptional teamwork and resilience. Casey, in command of a tactical unit, orchestrated maneuvers that outflanked the Varn forces, securing key positions and protecting Allied ships. The battle was fierce, with both sides sustaining heavy losses. In a pivotal moment, Casey's unit encountered a group of Varn soldiers threatening a group of captured civilians. Her protective instincts surged, and she led a daring rescue mission, saving the captives and turning the tide of the battle. The Varn, realizing they were outmatched, retreated. The victory at Zeta V was celebrated across the galaxy, solidifying the bonds between the allied species and showcasing humanity's remarkable strength and courage. In the aftermath of the battle, the Galactic Council recognized the need for continued vigilance. They established the Galactic Defense Initiative, a permanent coalition of forces dedicated to protecting against external threats. Captain Prax Thrawn and Casey were honored for their leadership and bravery, becoming symbols of interstellar unity. The Radiant Dawn continued its missions, now a key part of the Galactic Defense Initiative. Casey, revered for her protective instincts and leadership, trained new recruits from various species, imparting the values of empathy, courage, and cooperation. Years passed, and the alliance between humanity and the Galactic Federation grew stronger. The Radiant Dawn's legacy lived on, inspiring generations to come. Casey, now an admiral, oversaw the construction of new ships designed for exploration and defense, ensuring the safety and prosperity of all species. Captain Prax Thran retired, his contributions immortalized in the annals of galactic history. He spent his days sharing stories of the Radiant Dawn's adventures, emphasizing the importance of unity and the incredible potential within each individual. The galaxy thrived under the protection of the Galactic Defense Initiative, facing new challenges with the same spirit of cooperation and resilience that had defined their past victories. Humanity's unique traits, once seen as average, had become the cornerstone of a peaceful and prosperous galaxy. And so, the story of the Guardian Instinct continued, a testament to the extraordinary power of empathy, courage, and the unwavering instinct to protect and care for one another. Basically, to summarize, empathy is a theme. Empathy is the theme. Empathy is humanity's superpower. And the video you just watched was to help you see what is to come. This was speaking on what's to come, not necessarily what has happened. All right, here's my last one. I can't wait to uh to uh to show you. Um, but before we do so, for any of you who may be interested, you can head right on over to my website qreads.com. This is how you can get the various teas that I offer. And if you want to scroll on down, this is how you can book a session with me. 
And we have 17 days to this event, unlocking the mind's eye, wealth and abundance visual training. I did a, a visual training uh, about a week ago with about 23 people, and it was beautiful. It was incredible. Um, so I'm excited uh, to bring this next one up. Basically, I've discovered in various regression sessions that there is some type of deity or entity that is kind of holding back abundance, holding back wealth. And it is something that you have contracted. It is something that you have allowed to do this. Sometimes this agreement was from past lives. Sometimes this agreement is in this life. Um, your mind plays a huge role into these things. How you what you believe you're worth. So sometimes you have to ask yourself what projects this restriction upon me, and this can help with that. So it's um. Unlocking the Mind's Eye, Wealth and Abundance, Visual Training. Go to register. It's on August 4th on a Sunday. Um, and uh, 55. It's 55 plus a $1.38 service fee. Embark on an extraordinary journey unlocking the Mind's Eyes. Mind's Eye, Wealth and Abundance, Visual Training. Uh, this unique visual training session. Invites you to dive deep into your inner world, connecting to the powers of self, wealth, and visualization. Through immersive visual techniques hosted by Q Reads, we explore the vast depths of self that is often locked away within you while enabling you to connect with the creative energy of self, wealth, and abundance. This session is designed to foster personal insight, spiritual growth, and a deeper sense of tranquility and awareness. Focusing on the term Q Reeves cause rich rising. So for those of you who want to kind of know the theme for August 4th, rich rising, um, unlocking self wealth. So head right over to the website. I think this can even be uh, paid for through um, Sizzle, uh, which is a payment plan system. So we're going to break it up into like $12 a week over the next few weeks. That's the option as well. So, yeah, um, the ticket sales in at 10 a.m. August 4th, for those of you who are interested. I'm also excited to see a lot of y'all in Atlanta. So, if any of you are going to be there in Atlanta uh, for Brother Rich Gathering of the Masses, um, kind of dropping a comment, I'm going to be there. Um, I'm excited to see a lot of y'all as well. Uh, let's get to this last video. This last video is an exciting one. heard of the Aura Nataru Shari, also known as the Galactic Federation of Worlds. According to NSA released documents, the Galactic Federation is an organization uniting various sapient species of the galaxy. It was formed a few hundred years before the humanoid expansion of Orion, with guiding principles to maintain peace in all galaxies, serve others, raise consciousness levels, and uphold justice and freedom for all species in every star system. Most of the GFW are alien humanoids of varying types, with diverse skills and abilities, united for peacekeeping, combating the Chiapa Empire, and healing the primordial mother of the cosmos. Many leaders within this group, particularly the Council of Five, resemble Earth's fictional comic book, Superheroes, which has inspired stories. This is, yeah, New Justice League... This is your uh, Avengers. It's these five individuals that have come together to help balance out Earth and the universe. This is not a comical uh, thing. This is actually written about even in ancient texts. Such from DC Universe's Justice League and Stan Lee's Marvel's Avengers. There is an even smaller allied group with the Federation known as the Orion League and United Worlds Alliance, reminiscent of the Power Rangers. In December 2020, General Haim Eshed, the 87-year-old former head of Israel's space program, revealed that the United States and Israel have been in contact with extraterrestrial civilizations for several years 
and have finally formed a relationship with the Galactic Federation after once being under the sway of the Reptilian Empire. In an interview with Yediot Aharonot, he claimed that this cooperation includes a secret base on Mars where Americans and extraterrestrial representatives are beginning to collaborate. He also suggested that former American President Donald Trump was discouraged by the Federation from disclosing its existence to the world until the world is ready and introduced appropriately. The Galactic Federation's existence has inspired Earth's major science fiction works such as the Star Trek series, Babylon 5, Guardians of the Galaxy, Men in Black and Star Wars. The Galactic Federation of Worlds was established following the ratification of the Council Reformation Act over 30 million years ago in the fifth dimension. Prior to this, there was significant unrest in the galactic community regarding the tyranny of the... This is why many of us are able to observe some of the wars of the Galactic Federation because these wars are operating out of the fifth dimension. This is why as we are continuing to resurrect ourselves into the fifth dimension, we are going to start seeing these things in our physical life, which is what Rick and Morty was showing. In the previous clip. The Chica Empire, colonization, slavery, and genocides. After the Orion Liran Wars ended, many systems and colonies had developed and declared independence, becoming sovereign nations. However, these new governments were often overlooked in the council, as the elected representatives primarily focused on their own planet's interests and eventually fell into the hands of the Draco Chaka Empire and their alliances. A small, diverse planetary system was inhabited and colonized by the Draco. Eventually, a fierce war broke out with the land's natives. The children of the Nabu and Akari peoples were enslaved at young ages, similar to human trafficking on Earth. <laughs> this species remains childlike in appearance throughout their lives, even as they age normally. Amidst this conflict, there was a perilous mission to rescue systems suffering from slavery or genocide by the Chiakir. Council member Alessia Aso and Ambassador Raul Moreno of Beckenstein initiated a push for a reformation of the galactic governments to dissuade them from dealing with the Draco reptilians and their collectives. This movement garnered unexpected support from across the galaxy, and in 2235 CE, the reformation began. Over the millennia, Elections were held on every planet associated with the Citadel to elect council members for the new Galactic Council. In early 2240, the new council voted to decide the composition of the executive branch, the High Council. As expected, Aiso and Mourinho were among the five elected, along with Udnut Gort of Tuhanka, Councillor Tiberian of Vega, and council member Queen Tiamat of Orion, who replaced Turian Councillor Sparatus. You hear that? Queen Tiamat of Orion. You also saw an individual that was like a white lion. His name is Devin. And then there's another lion known as Aslan, which is where the lion of which the wardrobe gets that name from. Following the Reformation, the Federation reorganized trade routes and alliances and began admitting new nations to the Council. The military was also revised. With the ratification of the Galactic Forces Assignment Act, every nation was required to contribute troops to form the Federation military. The organization consisted of several forces, with the bulk of the military composed of humanoid species and insectoid soldiers. By 2250, the Federation had amassed a force equivalent to the alliances of the Chigger Empire. The Galactic Federation became the main political state of the Milky Way, a.k.a. Mutter's Spiral, following the decline of the Earth Empire at the turn of the fourth millennium. It was still operating as of the 40th century. Species whose homeworlds are members include Alpha Centaurans, humans, Ice Warriors, Arcturians, Vegan, Pakars, Pleiadians, Lyrans, and many more from thousands of galaxies. Federation members still enjoy full political authority within their own territories, 
as the Federation Council is forbidden from directly interfering with internal matters of its member planets. The Galactic Federation of Worlds then united as peacekeepers and holders of justice in this galaxy and even interdimensionally. The main task for the GFW is to raise awareness among Earthlings about the subversion of their societies by the Chiakra Reptilian Empire, Orion Grey Collective, the Maitre, and Keely Tokarit, helping to identify and expose corrupt institutions and elite manipulation in liaison with these enemies. The GFW now monitors and develops strategies against advanced mind control technologies that the Draco Empire is using on Earth. They monitor extraterrestrial infiltration, work on deprogramming mind control, rescuing abductees, and where possible, removing implants and handling many other minor tasks. I hope we are caught in that. This is vital. Listen, there's a lot of shit being said in this video. Hopefully y'all go back and you maybe write down and toast the species. Look, bro, there's so much codes in this. I'm just playing it so we can have it down. And it be in more places than one. Because they tend to try to take things away from us. So if we break it up, say things while I'm talking in front of it, they don't even recognize it in the same cadence. And we may be able to get things like this past 2025. Because 2025 is the the start of the cleansing. Project 2025 is a thing, but not whatever the hell that book says. Project 2025 has to do with the cleansing. We're, we're, we're. We're in the thick of it. We're like in the thick of it. If you don't see it, hey, Biden about to drop out? Ain't that what we put just out? Didn't Biden just drop? Bruh, bruh, bruh. The main races that are members of the Federation's Council are involved in assisting Earthlings in these efforts. But though the idea of expansion was split among the leaders of the Federation, Marino, also known as Merlin, pushed for rapid growth. And over the next millennia, the Ashtar Galactic Command, United Worlds Alliance, the Republic of Lucia in the Orion Star System, Principal Republic of Asteria in Vega System, Republic of Benning, Feros Union, and over a dozen other planetary governments joined the Federation. The total number of governments with seats on the Galactic Council had reached 52. The Council of Five was then established as a higher branch of the Federation. The Council of Five is based in the Orion area and was formerly known as the Council of Nine, created by the Elm. Now, Lilith, the entity known as Lilith, was a part of this council. And her actions got her kicked out or booted out of Orion. This is why the theory is Lilith has chosen to embed herself inside of humanity so that she can enter back into Orion when you enter back into Orion. Now, there's a lot of stuff to that. Remember, good and bad is a very complicated thing, but I would just be trying to put you on game a little bit so y'all know what's happening and what's going on. Ulanuk from Ardamant are now composed of these five races only. Aurela, Igoroth, Ginovo, Raiden, and Emetha. They have been involved in protecting Earth long before the creation of the Galactic Federation of Worlds, which they later joined as council representatives. They have monitored your species since its days as organisms floating in your oceans, witnessing its evolution into primates, the meddling of the Anunnaki, the various Earth colonizations from all parts of the galaxy, the arrival of evil empires, and the territorial alien wars on Earth. The Council of Five, currently led by the Egoroth, has met with Earth leaders on many occasions, Attempting to influence their decisions with wisdom, a task that has... Those are elf beings, by the way. Elf, elves, 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 elves. Those are elves, by the way. Proven quite difficult. Unlike the Federation's prime directive, the Council of Five does not adhere to a rule of non-intervention. They view intervention as necessary to help incapable worlds avoid fatal mistakes that could lead to destructive paths. The Council met with Earth leaders in 1944 and more recently in August 2013 to discuss the threats posed by the Orion and Chakra empires, the Cabal alliances of Amun-Ra, and the aftermath solutions of non-intervention. The Andromedan Council is akin to a United Nations of our galaxy, also known as the Xenotean Alliance, 
consisting of 133 representatives from planetary systems and races. The Andromedans are the race that taught the Pleiadians their cosmic wisdom and technology. They possess psychic abilities akin to Professor X in Marvel Comics. The council members are spiritually advanced and have sent envoys known as Starseeds to Earth with a mission to help develop higher Christ consciousness. Operating for thousands of years, they adhere to strict codes and guidelines of conduct. They do not see themselves as saviors, as they believe human souls gain nothing by being saved, as it detracts from their own evolutionary experience of finding the creator of all and the source within themselves. The Andromeda constellation is located 44 light years away from Earth and contains 16 main stars with at least 24 confirmed exoplanets. Additionally, the Andromeda, or M31 galaxy, is a staggering 2.5 million light years away, within the same line of sight as the constellation. Some claim to have met or communicated with extraterrestrials from Andromeda, who share ancestry and DNA with many African and Asian. I have. I have directly communicated with an entity out of the Andromeda galaxy. So... A long time ago, a voice spoke to me and referred to itself as Sabbathel. Sabbathel, where the word Sabbath or Saba comes from, means intelligence, means angel and or intelligence that communicates divine light. Now, this is just a very simple breakdown. But in the Andromeda galaxy, they have... Organic entities and inorganic entities. And the intelligence doesn't necessarily have to take on a form or a body. So this entity known as Sabbathel communicated to me back in 2012 or 13. Um, and then, of course, many, many other things have followed. Um, now, when I say communicate to extraterrestrials, um, no, I don't have a conscious recollection of abduction. Um, if I wanted to recall being on ships and stuff like that, I mean, I have access to that. But then it gets complicated because I don't know if this is the future, if this is past memories. If I've started to come to the conclusion that I don't even care about when the memories were. Like, I don't even care about when anymore about the memories. It's just a matter of can I access them. And that, as I have more ability to see things that most don't, it shows that I'm doing something right, not that I'm doing something wrong. And we're in a society that wants you to feel like, oh, you think different than everyone else? Well, that's wrong. Unless you sport one of them, you know, L G P T F T P Q F B C T D, you know, one of them, then it's okay for you to. I'm sorry. What? No, no offense to none of you. I'm just saying it's fucked up. Like, it shouldn't be that way. Asian human populations on Earth due to interfering with the Anunnaki of Nibiru, highlighting the significant role of the Andromedan Council in galactic affairs and our solar system. They foresaw the future of Earth and recognized today as the tipping point in history after 5,700 years of reptilian occupation. The first mention of an Andromeda Council originated from Edward Billy Meyer's contact notes in 1975. Meyer claimed contact with human-looking extraterrestrials from the planet Era in the Tegeta star system of the Pleiades constellation. His claims and evidence were... Era is home of an entity known as Eros. You go catch these things. Go catch these things. Was studied by multiple UFO researchers, including Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens, USAF retired, who found them to be genuine. Meyer's contact notes provided insights into the galaxy's history, including human colonies emigrating from one star system to another to escape enemies and planetary disasters. Meyer described how the Pleiadians encountered a highly evolved race of extraterrestrials in the Andromeda constellation, who became advisors to the Pleiadians and their colonies. 
Lele. Besides benevolent groups like the GFW, Council of Five, and the United World. That is Lele. This is why it's, it's considered the Seven Sisters. And these Seven Sisters are contained or restricted as oracles for an entity you may want to refer to as... Samuel, Lelu, Lucifer, Baron Zombies, different names for this, but basically Lilith and this bull-headed entity is kind of keeping a group of feminine females uh, imprisonment in this system um, and using them as oracles to reach the Andromeda constellation. Oops. There are also malevolent groups and alliances aligned with the Chaka Empire for self-service. The first malevolent group opposing the GFW and the galaxy is the Corporate of Altair, headquartered on the fourth planet of the Altairan system, which maintains dubious ties with the Ashtar and Draconian collectives simultaneously. This diverse group comprises blonde humanoid races, ranging from light melanin to dark melanin with blue or orange hues, and cooperates with a race of greys. The corporate is not part of the empire, but is heavily involved in abductions and interbreeding programs. The Ashtar Collective of Sirius B is composed of various humanoid types, including greys, reptoids, and genetically engineered species known as the Syrian Collective. Their headquarters. Y'all already do this to me. Alright. Let me help you understand something. <laughs> Drake's name is Aubrey Graham. He was born Aubrey Graham. He is an actor. He has figured out how to act like a draconian. And because he did such a good job acting like a draconian, he now is identified as Drake. And you would say Drake, you know, Drake, the draconian. Now, you may not process the draconian, but you call him Drake, which is short for draconian. Lilith played the role of Tiamat and played the role so well that it's like she's Tiamat. I need you to understand that mimicking is a real thing. But mimicking is also a form of flattery. Almost as if in order for you to even be initiated in the club of Tiamat in the first place, one must mimic Tiamat. Just like Bobby Hammond be telling you, everything you've been taught, sometimes you got to think different. You've been told mimicking or copying someone is wrong. But what if it is an initiation? So there's a lot to this. But I, I keep building up a little more to this every time I try to give you all these breadcrumbs. Because like I said, we have to think expansive, not limited. is on planet Morga in the Sirius B system. This group has engaged in conflicts with peaceful Syrians over the ownership of 21 star systems. The Ashtar Collective is also involved with Earth's shadow governments. And Every single female on this planet is tied into something. And if the females are operating off of a certain Cadence, for example, say these females are oracles on this planet prophesizing. Well, how are they able to prophesize? Because the oracle on this planet is connecting to the oracle or the symbols in the Pleiots. The Pleiot symbols are connecting to a version of them in Andromeda. So it's like, like a signal from Andromeda to Pleiots, from Pleiots to Earth. It's like traveling information, once again, sound. 
So if the females here can free themselves, it only reverberates to the other aspects or dimensions of self. So yes, they can be free. If women on this planet, especially those operating out of oracle-like behaviors, free themselves. And what do you mean free themselves? Get out that fucking job that's restricting you. Get out of that marriage that's restricting you. Get out of anything that is restricting your gift and your abilities. The moment you free yourself and can freely explore yourself, your oracle abilities, like I say, it reverberates into the to the other aspects of things. You have came here to help another version of yourself. You are here because you're feeding the information of self to something else or someone else, but that someone else is still you. The Amun Ra Cabal, a group on earth that operates all secret alliances under the Anunnaki Royal named Amun Ra or Marduk, ruling earth under the control of the Chiaka Draco Empire. The Reptilian Draco Chiaka Empire extends from Cygnus to Perseus and Orion. I'd be arguing with Marduk. Marduk be inside of so many of y'all. I'd be arguing with Marduk left and right. Shut the fuck up. God damn. You ain't nothing but a mummy. You ain't nothing but a dead motherfucker wrapped up being brought back to life for your war tactics. In the moment there's no more war on this planet, they ain't gonna need your ass. And that's what be killing me about like these entities. And I be looking at them like family man, me members. I'd be like, bro, you don't see your ass as just being used? You a fucking warrior. And that's what they use you as. You can't be nothing more than a warrior. And it's just like everything is worth more than a singularity. Everything. Everything. They think they doing something because they got an identity, a title. They fucking name is written down in books that ain't even going to matter a hundred years from now. Shit is crazy. Shit is crazy. Marduk, shut the fuck up. Having colonized over 500 worlds and establishing a presence on thousands of planets. Their symbol is a pyramid with an eye in the middle and a long snake wrapped around in a circle. If the Galactic Federation of Worlds were to cease its operations, significant planet-wide destruction would ensue, plunging Earth into a post-apocalyptic nightmare. The GFW leadership acknowledges that rival extraterrestrial alliances, specifically the Draconian Reptilian Chakar Empire and the Orion Alliance Collective, possess greater overall military strength. See, I'm going to have me see and ask questions. Okay. I see what we have. I see. So it's Amun Ra, son, isn't good. Y'all have to stop assuming that the word Ra means the son that you are familiar with. In ancient cultures, Venus was looked at as the morning star or sun. In ancient cultures, they looked at uh, Saturnalia or Saturn as Helios, as the sun. There are There are many different celestial objects that have been deemed the sun. So the reason why Amun is connected to Ra is because we're talking about Saturn. And there is an entity that dwells on Saturn that is responsible for making sure you come back there. And the goal is for you to go back to the deserts of Saturn. The goal is for you to desert your life when you die. Because the moment you enter someone else's life, desert your life, step into the light. The moment you go into the light, you are relinquishing you. And this entity needs to do this in order to keep the Amanti alive. Halls of Amanti. It needs to keep a record. And the halls of Amanti or Amanti is to combat Akasha. So you have two different records. You got the Records of the halls of, Mon of, of Amanti, and then you have the uh, Akashic records. And the Akashic records is basically holding on the feminine construct, while Amanti is holding on to the masculine construct. But a male ain't nothing but a dead female, an unalive female. I don't even want to get into all that because it can get complicated, it can get sticky. 
and I'm tired, and I've, I've had a long day, and I start getting frustrated and fussing. This is why I don't want to fuss. That's why I said, Marjorie, shut the fuck up. Because I get angry. I get aggravated. I'm not at war no more. But I feel like I'm like, it's aggression now, you know? Just speaking his name represents aggression. It's fucked up. So let's finish this video, y'all. Let's finish this video. However, these rival forces would withdraw from their operations on Earth if the GFW were fully committed to defending it. Previous remote viewing sessions have discussed these opposing extraterrestrial forces, likening them to Nazis and reptilians in Antarctica and U.S. presidential meetings with extraterrestrials. The Galactic Federation of Worlds has bases on Earth in Antarctica, where they share areas with other extraterrestrial beings. They also have underwater bases near the Sub-Antarctica Base, Northern Sea, Irish Sea and Indian Ocean. There are also underwater bases in Atlantic North between Iceland and Ireland, East Pacific, South Pacific North Pole, and offshore Alaska. There are all... That would be nice. That would be nice. That would be nice. Listen. Why would I say something like Marduk, shut the fuck up? I'm saying this because you ever deal with someone in warrior mode or anger mode? Do they even be saying anything that makes sense? Do you take anything a person that's pissed the fuck off, angry, turned up warrior mode, my butt, murk your ass? Do you take anything these individuals say seriously? And if you do, what the fuck is wrong with you? If Marduk came from a political position, if Marduk actually came forward on some let's talk, I would never be like Marduk, shut the fuck up. But he has yet to do that. Every time he comes forward, it's rah, 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 rah. It's some extra shit. And who wants to hear that? I'm not about to fight you. You arguing with yourself. You screaming, yelling, you doing all that for yourself. I ain't about to feed that. Especially if I have memories of beating your ass before and winning. What I need to do it before. It's what I need y'all to realize too. If you're able to gain a body right now, you beat your overlords. If you got a body right now, you beat them already. Shut the fuck up. What are you saying anything to me right now for? To me. It's like Timu or to me. Motherfuckers just want to keep getting my, my, my attention and want me to sit there and spin and buy. No. Shut the fuck up. That's what I mean. And this is an allegory for people who be aggressive, people who just want to be warriors, want to be, yeah, 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 shut the fuck up. I'm not even acknowledging you. Come correct. But they dead. This is why Christians, entities that follow a being that died, their whole religious, their whole religious order is on death. Catholics, catacombs, death. I want y'all to know, they be talking shit to me, though. They be like, I'm about to come. Just when we show up. Just wait till we show up. And I'm just like, okay, how many of y'all really willing to die for this? I've been said that. I've been, what? Honestly, I felt like I done, done went through some crazy shit already. If you want to refer to it as death or whatever terms you want to use, sure. But what don't kill you only make you stronger. You have to remember that. That's why they so adamant about focusing on death, because it's really about rebirthing oneself. And they have to constantly rebirth themselves. You want me to tell you a secret? You really want me to tell you a secret? Why? Why? And I'll just refer to it as like the colonizer. Why the colonizer is so obsessed with death? Because they are a new species. They're trying to keep up with souls that have died 50,000 times. You done died 50,000 times. You got this colonizer that probably has about 100 life experiences trying to keep up with someone who got 50,000 life experiences. And they're like, I can't do anything with that. How the fuck am I supposed to compete with 50,000 lifetimes? I guess I got to keep going through the death ritual as many times as I can in this life so I can try to be close to you. That's the secret. Just so you know. They're just trying to get on your level. At the end of the day. 
Also many Chakra Empire and Alliances bases in between these areas as well. If the Chakra wins the war, the governments of all worlds will utilize coordinated attempt of the Cabal to deceive the public that aliens are coming to invade and destroy Earth. They will use an advanced technology that will fool the public in believing in going to war and spending trillions for more mass weapons of destruction from Genesis. There are two main reasons for this situation. First, the membership of the Galactic Federation of Worlds is divided. While most members clearly want to help, there are significant doubts within the organization about their actual capabilities, particularly in terms of military strength. Earth is a relatively backwater planet on the periphery of the galaxy, which works in your favor. If opposing galactic forces were to make a major effort to stop the Galactic Federation of Worlds from assisting humanity, it seems clear that those opposing forces could potentially overpower the Federation. However, the calculation is that the opposing forces might not deem Earth worth a major confrontation at this time, especially if it would be costly. The Draconian Empire and the Orion Alliance have fortunately lost their grasp on Earth in 2021 thanks to efforts of the Council of Five and GFW collectives. Many Chakra minions are in hiding and still control assets, allowing them to still manipulate humanity's destiny if humanity does not fight back. William Bramley describes this process succinctly in his book, The Gods of Eden, which traces centuries of contrived extraterrestrial conflicts orchestrated through controlled political elites to manipulate Earth's evolution. It is the hope that humanity on Earth will rise and defeat this last confrontation to move on to the higher densities of existence. It is important to remember the Anunnaki royals contributed to the genetic code of altering humans' DNA for worshipping. The Nibiruan prince Enki gave mankind the ability to turn on or off this at their own behest. You should never worship anyone other than your higher self, and you should always serve the ones you love and others in need. This idea coincides with the geometric flower of life. Remember, God is in you and outside of you, not God in a religious kingly sense, but the God that is everything, the force, the source, the creator of all. To all starseed emissaries sent by the Galactic Federation, please stay radiating your own light throughout the darkness and invoke your guardian spirit and ascended masters. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, What a jerk. You know? What a jerk. Marduk been trying me my whole life. My middle name is Marcus. Marduk has been trying me my whole life. My father's name is Marcus. I'm dead. And I came to the conclusion, if you don't have nothing good to say, then don't say shit to me. Don't say nothing at all. And you have every right to that. I need y'all to remember, this is your body. This is your rules. For those who have had regressions, have actually been able to experience that in like physicality or in real time. This is your body. This is your rules. So hopefully you've gotten something out of today's live. I will be back up here tomorrow. Hinka, the manifestation mentor, will be back.